And family, again, it's also a delight to be in and with uh, this, the book of Hebrews. Um, it has been a, an incredible challenge and a reminder of its, its, its authority to us, for me. We're going to be in it for only two more weeks. Uh, then we're going to begin a, a book study in Esther, and you'll see promotion about it. But it's a wonderful book, especially as we go through COVID-19. And the reason that that makes it very applicable for today is it is the only book in, the, in all of the Bible that never mentions God. We don't see God. He doesn't come down and talk. He never, he never interacts like, like you and I know many of the stories of the Old Testament. There is no interaction. And so, if you will, every page we see His divine providence. We see His authority. We see His prayer-answering ability. Just like we should be seeing it today. And in the same way that you can go through any life experience and forget God is taking you through the good times and the bad, this book allows us to see, if you will, the big picture without seeing the invisible God. And yet we get to see over and over and again the authority of God. So uh, I'm quite excited as we, we head into the examination of the book of Esther. But for the next two weeks, we're going to be in Hebrews. And, and again, don't forget why we're in chapter 13. You're in chapter 13 because the first 12 chapters set the stage doctrinally of what you have in Jesus Christ. That's why we've called it from the beginning, my final answer. Now, I'd have kept it my final answer, but sometimes you can't break sermons down into a, an easy flow. But then we remind ourselves that, that it's the greater thing and, and no other plan in the past, Moses or the sacrifices, the high priest, nothing in the past is in any way superior or even comparable to what we have in Christ. Finally, it's enough. And if we really believe that Jesus Christ, who He is and what He did, was truly and completely our final answer, we come to chapter 13. And in chapter 13, we find the application of that. If He's really your final answer, you'll recognize that we come to chapter 13, verse 1, and He talks about brotherly love. Well, forgive us, but we don't love each other. Because we like each other. We love each other because we're family. And to that degree, we are lovingly stuck with each other. We, we know the same heritage. We have the same dad. We've been commissioned by the same authority of the Holy Spirit because we have the gift of eternal life given to us by Jesus Christ. And so you need to understand, we don't need to merely like each other by personality, like each other by, by the way in which we make each other laugh or, or we enjoy each other's company, but we have a bond. And, and that bond demands a connection and an investment. He goes on to tell us that the marriage bed is pure, and, and the point is is. There, there's a moral reality here that you and I recognize that we don't live in the, the world today that, that looks and finds satisfaction with a morality outside the joy of marriage, outside the bond of, of a commitment of marriage. And that moral commitment is driven not because we're phenomenally disciplined, we're driven because of who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did. There's a contentment in life. And certainly, of any moment in time in your lifetime, no matter what age you are, COVID-19 should remind you today that your contentment is not in the stuff down here. It's not in material things. It's, it's not in, in the stuff that the world provides. It's not in the, the political security that you have. It is in the authority of Jesus Christ. And so we don't have a contentment that we rest simply here. 
He then looks around and he says, wow, look at your leaders. The people that pointed you to Jesus Christ by their character, their, their, their love, loyalty, first to the church and then possibly ultimately to you individually. Their godliness, their, their lives, and begin to imitate them because they taught you. They, they shared the eternal truth of salvation with you. And you recognize that you want what they have and you want the truth that they taught you. And you look down and say, man, I want that. And as Kevin addressed last week, we looked at the superiority of Jesus Christ. We were reminded that what He did for us, so superior to the Old Testament sacrifice, that we now have a boldness in worship where what we know we now can live out and the world can see who and what we are. We come today to verses 15 and 16. And I'd like you to be there. And if you're not there by Bible, um, I would encourage you to be there by, by cell phone, if you will. Download the app real quick. Get on with us and look. They're a short passage of Scripture, just two verses. But they will have four areas of sacrifice. Kevin set the stage for us last week as he talked about some of the Old Testament sacrifices. And the New Testament uses a sacrifice just to simply remind us of the responsibility of service to the Lord. You see, sacrifice is meaningless unless the heart attitude is correct. And we're going to see it's important for that this morning. And so I want you to join with us as now we look. It just simply breaks down into four simple sections. It talks about our inner loyalty. It talks about our external expression. It talks about our actions to other people and our generous giving. And so as we already know the breakdown of the four, let's look at the verses that we're going to confront. It says this, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Family, um, through Jesus, Christians offer continually sacrifice of praise. Now, I want you to understand this is very important. I know many of you can't make it through 40 minutes of really strong thinking of a sermon. All right? I know that. I've watched your faces for years, all right? So in that case, let me warn you. If you're going to sit down and you're, you're not going to blitz out for about 20 minutes, this is the moment I don't want you to blitz out on, all right? If you're going to blitz out, wait for the other three. But we're going to spend time in this one, and it is so important that if you grasp this one, the other three sacrifices become easy. And they just almost spring out of your life so you don't need them. After saying that, pay attention anyway. But as we come to this first one, I want you to see its profound importance. Our worship should express our inner loyalty. Because the heart of sacrifice in both the Old Testament and to the New Testament believer, the heart is of utmost importance. The last five psalms that we find written in the book from 146 to 150 are psalms that start off with praise the Lord. Let me just simply remind you of what a treasure they are. So in 146 verses 1 and 2 it says praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. But it's interesting, here's verse 3. This is why he praises. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. 
when his breath departs, he departs to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Isn't that a great reminder of what we're experiencing now? Don't put your trust in anybody in, in, with human authority. Don't put your trust in their plans because there's going to come a day that they stop breathing. And when they stop breathing, so does the execution of their plans. We praise the Lord. He's eternal. Chapter 147, praise the Lord. Verse 5, great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. So we don't put our trust in the Son of Man. We put our trust in the eternal God who has an answer that's beyond our comprehension. Chapter 148, verse 1, praise the Lord. Notice verse 14, He has raised up a horn for His people. Praise for all His saints. Family, we recognize that whenever you use the horn in poetry here, He's always referring to the strength, the power, the authority of the Lord. And so He has raised up a power. Ultimately, that power is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is going to supply the ultimate strength, the ultimate opportunity to live out who we are in Christ here on earth and knowing that we have the strength to go then eternally. Praise the Lord. 148, 149 goes, praise the Lord. Verse 4 then gives us the reminder for the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He adores the, hum, the humble with salvation. And again, what a, what a privilege it is to remind ourselves that, you know, life's not always easy. Stuff happens in life. There are moments when life stinks. Life's not easy. But we have a relationship with someone who says, I always bring good into your life to those who know and, and trust me in salvation. You don't have to worry. I'm not only with you here in this bad moment, I'm with you through the experience, and I'm with you into the tomorrows when maybe the experiences change and it's not the same. And so we recognize that's our Lord, and finally He finishes off in 150. Praise the Lord! Verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So when you and I live out life, we have to remember, we didn't come in here at 9 o'clock, we didn't turn on Facebook at 9 o'clock so that we could worship God for an hour, an hour and 15, depending on how long that preacher is. We are 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week worshipers, all right? This is a privilege to us because we're now connected with one another as a family. As I'm praising the Lord Monday through Saturday, I, I don't have the day-by-day the -day connection with all of you. But boy, I get to come together with you. And in one intense moment in time, I'm, I'm driven to appreciate what God is doing corporately in all of us. But when we say praise the Lord and we're to have an inner attitude, that's how we begin. And if we don't begin with that, everything else becomes an error. If you will, Ecclesiastes says, a chasing after the wind. So you and I have to start with an e internal Understanding, And I want to suggest to you, we praise God for who He is and what He has done. Now, as I've told you, this is the most important part of the sermon, and I want you to turn your brains on for a moment, because if you really believe that Jesus is your final answer, if He's your sufficiency to allow you to live day by day, then I want to suggest to you praise should really come pretty easy for you. Do you understand that? I want to take you back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to tie these together by bookends. We're in the last chapter. We're going to come to the very first chapter, first verses. So I want you to hear it out. We're going to read the first four. It says this, beginning in verse 1. Long ago... At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, 
whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, family, in order to remind us of our internal loyalty, I want to look at three quick phrases. The first, he created, in whom also he created the world. Family, I want to remind you this morning, he created the world out of nothing. Now, what's important for you today is I need you to turn that wonderful thinking cap on. And if, the, if you're more creative than some, you'll appreciate it. But those of you who are not creative, I want you to walk with me. Follow along. Listen to the oxymoron of this short sentence. He existed in nothing. He is a something. Something existed in nothing. And nothing was satisfactory to he. Do you understand that? Where did God sit? Where did God live? What did God see? What was there in nothing? Now, in nothing... The Trinity existed in first, second, father-son relationship, Holy Spirit, in a dynamic appreciation of who and what they were in absolute joyful harmony. And in nothing, they were totally satisfied as they expressed love loyalty from son to father, obedience from son to father, knowing the eternal plan that they were going to lay out. And if you will, the Father and the Son's communication back and forth as the very Holy Spirit, as they speak to one another, as they address one another in love, and they are totally satisfied in that moment of time. And then, the Son spoke creation. What was there before creation? Jonathan Edwards, one of the first of the great American theologians, tried to describe it this way. He says, if rocks could dream, they would dream of nothing. Forgive me, but on one level, that's very funny. And on another level, deeper than you and I can appreciate. And then, the Son spoke. And when the Son spoke, the universe came alive. When the Son spoke, there became an earth. Then earth's water is set by boundaries. And the brown dirt held it in place. Family, understand it sprang forth with an incredible change that you and I often cannot fully comprehend. He shouted and the stars came together. And you look and you see the cluster of the Pleiades and they stay together as a reminder to us of His authority. And we recognize as we look at Orion's belt, the three stars, it was God who set them in place and buckled them. Family, it was God who put together the purple that you and I identify as a plum, waiting for the eyes of a human that He made by the doodling of His creative finger in the mud and the slime that He created from nothing. For that mud to dry 
and those eyes to see that purple plum and those taste buds that came out of that creative genius that made you. Your taste buds recognized the sweetness of that plum and enjoyed that plum and thanked God for the gift. Family, He's the Creator. He's the Creator God. Secondly, He's the exact radiance of the Father. Family, you and I don't really fully grasp that because we don't fully grasp that the radiance reflects the holiness of God. And if I would ask and pass out a piece of paper to all of us today and we'd all write our own definition of holiness, I want to suggest to you, as, as many people as, as here in worship this morning, uh, we'd all have a different definition. So let me suggest to you the simplest, and that might be separation. For whatever you think of as purity, God's as far separate from your definition as you can possibly imagine. When you identify purity or spirituality or uniqueness, He's as far away as you can think of. Family, we see in Isaiah chapter 6 a, a strong moment in the, the work of Isaiah the prophet. And he's describing a scene of God being in the temple, he in the temple with him. And we're not going to go through it. I want to read one verse about this incredible character. He says this beginning in verse 2. And above him, or above him, stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And on one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. On the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of Him who called. So family, only in this moment in the Bible of the seraphim mentioned, we don't ever hear of them again. And yet their power is sufficient vocally to shake the very foundations of the temple so that he felt like he's in a small tremor earthquake. Two of the six wings that they had, hear me out, covered their eyes. They were in front of the holy, majestic God. And if a sinless, angelic being in the closeness of to the eternal God would cover his face so as not to be overwhelmed by the holiness of God. The reactions of man can only be parallel to the man Isaiah who says, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. We often cavalierly say that God in his holiness can't be near sin. I believe that that's almost a misrepresentation of God's holiness. The truth of the matter is, our sinfulness can't be near God's holiness. All right? Recognize anytime a human's near a holy God, they're worried about their life. So God could present himself and say, I am totally and completely other. I am beyond anything that you can comprehend in holy purity and authority and all of my decisions, all of my character, all of my wonder is bound by my holiness. I want you to notice the third of those phrases. Making purification for our sin. Please, put all of them together. The Creator, 
who made the world from nothing, forming us with his finger in the mud. The Holy One, too radiant to present himself undiluted before us, leaving us mindful of our inadequacy, leaving of our, mi of our minds overwhelmed by our sinfulness, took on humanity, dying for our sins, and offering a purification that takes away the wrath of God and allows us to be in relationship with Him. Family, when our insides confront the reality of who Christ is and what Christ did, the external realities of these final three sacrificial behaviors should come easily. You see, if you really understand who God is, then the admitting that you and I are sinful becomes an easy task. You see, you and I can't make it. Our sin is something that will never, never clean ourselves up capable of standing before God. If Isaiah the prophet is completely overwhelmed by his majesty, where would that put any of us? And so to admit that we're sinners should be a very easy step. To look down and go, wow, I have no hope. I'm finished. And recognize what Jesus Christ did in purifying our sins should now give us pause and we run to it in belief. Wow, the one who is the radiance, the one who's the creator, is also my redeemer. Oh my goodness, I believe that. And so as I commit my life to it, the reality of confessing my inability, proclaiming his exalted gift to me, becomes a privilege that I now have eternally and have a chance to live out to a world that desperately needs to see. And so a sacrifice externally should now be a natural expression of who we are. Notice, if you will, our worship then is expressed externally. And it's found in the phrase, lips, or excuse me, fruit of the lips. It's a very rare expression in Scripture. It's found just three times. And this is one. We're going to read Isaiah. In Isaiah, it says this. Chapter 57, I have seen His ways as God explains His work to us in redemption. He says, I have seen His ways, humanity's ways. I will heal Him. I will lead Him and restore comfort to Him and to His mourners, casting or creating the fruit of the lips. He's the one who engineers praise here. And here's our praise. Peace. Peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord. I will heal them. And as we are healed through the purification of our sins, the natural outgoing of who we are is the fruit of our lips of our praise. So you need to be reminded what comes out Monday morning at work should reflect the fruit of our lips. What, what, what comes out on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday should simply reflect the joy of our salvation, the fruit of our lips. When we run into here, Jim Wally should never have to say, stand up, sing loud, pay attention, look at the lyrics, listen to what you're hearing. Man, it should just be on. Why? He created within us the fruit of our lips. And what an incredible 
reality to know that from the inside, God is transforming us to allow the outside to simply live out the joy that we know in Christ. You see, one freed from spiritual debt should express to others how much the Savior means to us. I want you to notice, thirdly, our worship is expressed in actions to others in Christ. Now, before we look at this, he just says, do good to others, and it's a generic phrase. But I want you to to know very certainly that if we're talking about sacrifice, we're not talking about a short, one-time burst of activity, as if I took cookies to my neighbor. All right? That is a good thing. But when we're talking about a sacrifice, it's a change of my life for the impact of others. I'm, I'm helping someone out. Kevin brought to us this morning the, the, the needs and the prayers of those unborn children. We should be loyal to the world and show them how important the life sanctity is. But I want you to hear me out. as they're born and on their way to become pampered people, adults, their kids all along the way, they're going to need your investment. They're going to need to see who Jesus Christ is. And if they don't see it in us, do you really expect them to live out a Christian life when they're 22 and 23? If they don't see it first, in their home. Their home being their home. Their home being the church that they worship in. Family, so as we talk about the gift to others, the action, I want you to understand it as a sacrifice of who we are, the time we spent, the investments we make. Jesus Christ simply expected that from His followers. So He could say in Matthew... Chapter 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Family, I say that because if we look at light, a strobe light is not all that impactful. All right? I did something good, I'm turned off. I did something good, I turned off. I did something good, I turned off. A light is valuable. When it's on and stays on. He could remind us of those good works are invested in our brothers and sisters in Christ. So that in John, he could say, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I loved you. As I made an investment to redeem you, make an investment of love in the brothers and sisters in Christ. So we obey the Lord. We extend our actions in loyalty to other believers. The Apostle Paul clearly taught that God has ordained that His people should practice good works. In doing so, Romans chapter 12 lists for us the very gifts that the Holy Spirit impacts upon us so that we may go out and serve one another. And He gives us abilities. And He strengthens characters so that when we go out and serve, we do so with the power and the privilege of working with the Holy Spirit who's taking our works and energizing them supernaturally. So let's look fourthly. Our worship is expressed in our generous giving. So he says, share with others. The word there, share, we could immediately satisfy your conscience because it's the word koinonia, fellowship. And we have taken that word and watered it down so bad that we've turned it into a cup of coffee out in the hallway. What'd you do this morning? I had fellowship with a brother in Jesus Christ. Well, what'd you do? Well, I ate a cookie and had a cup of coffee. 
All right? Fellowship within Scripture describes the relationship between Peter and Andrew and James and John. They had koinonia with one another. They shared. In other words, Peter's boat was James and John's boat. Peter and Andrew's net were James and John's net. The success of James and John's net was shared by Peter and Andrew. Peter and Andrew's successes in that net were shared by James and John. They advanced because they were a team and they shared life financially. They shared life experientially. They shared life in the ups and downs. Everything about their lives were so cast together that they knew koinonia. And so he comes to us here and he says, I want you to have koinonia with one another. I want you to be so bound together that when I say share the financial responsibilities, when I say share in everything in life, you recognize what that means. So our financial support of, of the Lord's work is a Christian sacrifice that we offer regularly, methodically, proportionately, and cheerfully. Now, let me tell you, both to our Facebook family as well as to those who have gathered here together this morning, you need to know that from the, from the elders' perspective, one of the great blessings of COVID-19 has been the ongoing ministry and what it's accomplished through the faithful giving of the church family. What a privilege. And those of you who have never put foot in door have been faithful in ways that have been a blessing and a monstrous surprise of the goodness and grace of Jesus Christ. And yet at the same time, that sharing goes beyond. It's investing in the life of someone else who's in need. It, it's, it's recognizing that someone else's shortfall may need to have uh, the blessing of our blessing to be in their lives. And so we offer sacrifice by sharing with others the good things that God has so generally given, generously given to us. Family, understand that ultimately Christianity is sacrificial through and through. It was founded on the one offering of Christ. And the offering of His people now is praise and property of service, of the investment of their lives into the lives of others. It is caught up into the perfection of His acceptable sacrifice. And our sacrifices are now acceptable and pleasing to Him. And so family, understand, as we come to the end of Hebrews, and we, we see now as we're putting the final pieces together, that if we really have confidence that Jesus is my final answer, I, I rest on that foundation, that the impact of my life is such that every corner of my being is influenced by the demands of the cross to work itself out in my life and submission to Him. And when we do that, God says here that He's happy with us. Father in heaven, I'd pray you'd be with us. Dear God, we're so quick to forget your goodness that you even tell us that you're the one who engineers our praise. You're the one who engineered our life in you. You're the one who gave us the Holy Spirit to equip us. You're the one who called us unto salvation as the Father gave us to the Son. You're the one through the Father that we became aware of salvation even before we were aware of salvation. What a privilege. Dear God in heaven, may we confront our insides 
making us aware of who Jesus Christ is, what He did for us, so that, dear God, the sacrifices that are now external become just a natural outpouring of how strongly we have connection with our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.